Welcome to the Dr. America Show. I am your host, Dr. Sanjeev Sriram. This week, we've got a lot to cover, guys. We're going to talk about the issues going on right now in Congress with concealed carry gun permits. We're going to be talking about superbugs. There is a inf- major infection going on uh, right now at UCLA. The number of people affected are not all that impressive, but what it means for our health, especially in our hospitals, places where we're supposed to be getting better, uh, it's important for us to understand what's going on with these superbugs, these, uh, these bacteria and other germs that are becoming more and more resistant to the antibiotics that are supposed to be killing them. And uh, we've got a really good guest. I'm really excited um, to be introducing you guys to our guest for that segment of the show. But uh, before we get into the into the superbugs, I, I want to talk about uh, something that I feel is a really major threat to our public health and our public safety, and that is this really really bad idea that's being proposed in Congress, the Constitutional Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act. Basically, this is a federally mandated concealed carry permit reciprocity act, and it's uh, it's a pretty dumb idea. Uh, So right now, when it comes to, you know, a concealed carry weapon permit, the, uh, the states get to decide who is too dangerous to carry a hidden loaded gun in public? Uh, in many states, if you have a record of committing a dangerous crime, if you are a domestic abuser, if you have a record of drunk driving, uh, then you do not get to carry a hidden loaded weapon in public. And that sounds like common sense, right? That sounds like the kind of thing that states ought to be doing to look after uh, public safety, and not every state does this, but lots of states do, and uh, and you know it's it's common sense, it's safety. Now, the dumb idea that's being proposed in Congress is that those states with really really weak gun laws that let any dangerous person or any really awful person that you would never want to carry a concealed weapon in public. Congress is saying that if they have a permit from one of those states with really weak laws, then the states with the really strong laws, the states with the really safe laws, have to respect and allow the permit from the state with the really weak laws. So this that's basically what concealed carry reciprocity means. It's going to be basically the federal government forcing states with very strong gun laws to uh, adopt and accept the gun permits from the states with the really weak gun laws. And as you can imagine, this is uh, a pretty dangerous scenario to uh, to have going on in our country. But just to kind of help it, help things hit home, I want to um, talk about the Every Town for Gun Safety report that just came out. Uh, these guys did a fantastic job writing about why it's so dangerous to force states to recognize concealed carry uh, permits from other states with really weak and really loose gun laws. And um, I thank everybody at the Every Town for Gun Safety organization. I think uh, you guys did a fantastic job with this report. I'm really proud to be uh, wearing the shirt. Um, and uh, I admire that a lot of the work that you guys do because you know, you're compiling the data from uh, public health organizations, from law enforcement, from um, from our judiciary system, and you know they're really making such an excellent evidence-based case uh, for why a variety of really dangerous, dumb gun law ideas are just that dangerous. And they've done the same right now for uh, for this federal mandatory concealed carry uh, gun permit reciprocity. And uh, their, their report actually features this unbelievable story that I need to share with you guys about this guy over in Idaho, Jason Kenneth Hamilton. He is right at the beginning of Every Town for Gun Safety's report, and he is a textbook example of why we cannot be allowing states with weak gun laws to send weak you know, permits to states with really strong gun laws. So here's Hamilton's story. In 1991, he was 21 years old and Hamilton was charged with domestic abuse. On a lot of different occasions over the years, he got charged with aggravated assault, drug possession, pulling a gun on his landlord and threatening to blow his effing head off 
and killing an ex-girlfriend's puppy whose back he broke after picking it up by its leash, choking the dog, and kicking it. In June 2006, he was convicted of domestic battery for strangling his live-in girlfriend. The jury in the strangulation case, this is an Idaho jury, actually wrote to the judge requesting that the lengthiest sentence be made possible on, on Hamilton. All right. So having this conviction made Hamilton legally prohibited from owning firearms under federal law. OK, but because of the way that, you know, we're we're we live in we live with federalism. Right. So we've got both, you know, federal and state gun laws. And uh, Hamilton was able to acquire several guns under his uh, state law, not to, several guns. And because of the weak permitting system in Idaho, this guy, who is a card-carrying Aryan Nations member, I kid you not, the guy paid membership to the Aryan Nations, this guy is able to obtain a state permit to carry a concealed firearm. So he is actually following Idaho state law. He has a legal permit to carry a concealed weapon, a hidden weapon, out in public. This is exactly the kind of person that we would not want, you know, doing this kind of thing, but in Idaho, this is all right. All right, less than a year after Hamilton's domestic violence conviction, and while holding his Idaho concealed carry permit, Hamilton goes on a shooting rampage. He fatally shot his wife. Side note, side note. This this uh, th- this piece of dirt right here has marriage rights. This guy has you know dog killing, puppy killing, you know gun nut has marriage rights. But some people are catching feelings about uh, gay people having marriage rights. This guy gets to get married legally. You know law abiding gay people don't get to get married. You 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 know you got okay. We're gonna come back to the story, but that was an important side note. All right, so. Okay, Jason Kenneth Hamilton shoots his wife, then goes to the courthouse where she was she had been working and she starts firing away where you know and when police responded, he shot and killed a police officer. He tries to run away, he runs to a church that's across the street from the courthouse and he shoots and kills the church sexton and then uh Jason Kenneth Hamilton committed suicide. Now Mind you, like, remember, the important part of the story is, is that he is carrying a legal Idaho permit to carry a concealed weapon. Okay. Now, the thing is, is that, like, his case actually demonstrates why we would probably not want other states respecting Idaho's permit. Because, after all, if Idaho is going to let somebody like this carry a, a hidden weapon, do we really want to let people with just an Idaho permit to be allowed to carry weapons in other states. And actually, I'm not the only one who sees it this way. Okay, half the states that border Idaho, okay, including Nevada, Oregon, Washington State, they have all said that they will that they will not grant reciprocity, meaning that they will not legally recognize Idaho's standard concealed carry permit, which means that if you go to Nevada, Oregon, or Washington State, you have to get their state's permit, or you have to get one from a state where they do, you know, recognize that state's uh, concealed carry permit. Um, and so, you know, you can see, like, I mean, this entire story with Jason Kenneth Hamilton is actually, to me, the moral of it all is that it proves why we cannot be allowing states with very loose, very weak gun laws to be telling the rest of us who is and who is not allowed to carry a concealed weapon around in public. Now, despite all of that, the main sponsor of this bill in the Senate, the, the this is the federal mandatory You know, the federal government telling the state governments that, you know, no matter how strong or strict your gun laws are, you have to recognize the uh, concealed carry permits from weaker states. Uh, This bill sponsor is uh, Senator John Cornyn from Texas. And he said that the federal mandated concealed carry reciprocity operates more. This is his quote operates more or less like a driver's license. So, for example, if you have a driver's license in Texas, you can drive in New York, in Utah, and other places subject to the laws in those states. Now, 
Okay, and that's the end of the quote. That might sound like common sense, except you're wrong, Senator. You are totally wrong because this is not at all like driver's licenses. Because there is no national data system that police can use to check if you have a valid out-of-state concealed carry permit. For instance, like when I first moved to DC, right? Like I have a California driver's license because that's where I learned to drive and that's where my driver's license is from. It's from the state of California. I come to DC, if I ever have to show a DC policeman my, you know, my driver's license, that policeman can, you know, verify that it is a valid California license. Same thing goes if I go to Maryland, if I go to Virginia, our next door neighbors, I show them that California driver's license, they have ways of verifying that it is valid, that it is actually issued to me. And it's because we have this national data system that helps the police verify these kinds of things. But we don't have anything like that for concealed carry permits, not at all. And the reason why is because the gun lobby extremists have basically made it impossible for our law enforcement to verify your track record on your gun permit. Okay, this means that like the police have... Inter- like, so what this all kind of comes down to to bring it down to like individual interactions between you know people with carrying a concealed weapon and the police what this now means is that like if you are a cop and you're trying to pull over somebody you know during a routine traffic stop let's say something like that right if this person has a concealed weapon all right let's say they're from a place like Idaho with clearly very weak gun laws that policeman has no way of verifying whether you are allowed to even carry that gun that permit they have no way of figuring out whether this is a valid permit are you allowed to carry this permit because we have no national data tracking system for all of this so now this routine traffic stop just became more dangerous do you really think the police want to risk their life pulling over people like Jason Hamilton over for a regular police stop when you know they have no concept of like okay like it you know this guy is carrying a weapon he's allowed to carry a, a hidden gun you know is it legal is it illegal the police have no way of knowing this and because of that because the police have no way of actually knowing how to keep the public safe and because they lack this data system they are very opposed to this bill that's being discussed in the Senate right now. There are hundreds of police groups and law enforcement organizations that have come out against these proposals in Congress to mandate concealed carry reciprocity. In addition, 32 states and D.C. have all come out against this policy. And I really hope that, you know, you guys will, too. Now, some states, you know, they, like I was saying before, are trying to make sure that people with dangerous records, you know, of criminal behavior, of, you know, actually like a proven track record of being a threat to the public. We're talking about drunk drivers. We're talking about domestic abusers. They are really trying their best to make sure that these folks don't get their hands on a weapon. And they're really trying to make sure that they don't get their hands on a, on a permit to carry a hidden weapon in public. Now, th- this is not every state. This is like, you know, this is a lot of states, but not every state. And the reason why this matters to me as, you know, as a pediatrician is because I don't want teenagers to have even easier access to guns. Right now, federal law prohibits people under the age of 18 from owning a handgun, but they don't set, like, the federal law does not set an age minimum for owning a rifle or shotgun. And this is where state law comes into effect. And, you know, you have states, now you have some states like Montana and New Hampshire that do not have any additional age restrictions beyond what federal law says. You know, they basically say, like, okay, if you're under the age of 18, you're not allowed to own a handgun, but anybody can own a rifle or shotgun if, you know, in places like Montana or shouldn't say anybody, but like any any age group, you know, depending on certain restrictions in Montana and New Hampshire are allowed to own uh, rifles and shotguns. Now, you have some states uh, like Iowa and Connecticut where they don't let anyone under 21 have handguns. Um, so they actually like set the age restriction even higher than 18. Um, you have, you know, states like Michigan and Nevada, which say that, OK, if you're under the age of 18, you cannot own a handgun, a rifle or a shotgun. Um, and, you know, more than two thirds of all states set, you know, set the minimum age for a concealed carry weapon permit 
um, at the age of 21. That's uh, that's two thirds of the states say that you cannot walk around with a you know, a hidden weapon in public uh, if you're under the age of 21. Um, but 12 states let people younger than that uh, get away with that. Get, you know, they let people with uh, you know, under the age of 21, walk around in public with a concealed weapon. And, you know, so this and this is why it's uh, it's concerning me as a pediatrician. I don't really believe that teenagers, you know, have the right judgment to, you know, be making these kinds of calls of of uh, carrying, uh, you know, weapons in public. And I don't believe it should be any easier for them to, you know, get guns than it is already. Um, now, some members of Congress and the lobbyists from, you know, the NRA and other gun industry groups, they're trying to really oversimplify this issue by equalizing the Second Amendment gun rights uh, to other rights like freedom of speech and and freedom of religion. Uh, in fact, there was this guy, Eric Pratt. He's a spokesman for the Gun Owners of America. If you want to talk about a an extremist gun lobby group that is out of touch with all kinds of common sense and safety. Um, you've got the gun owners of America and their spokesman, Eric Pratt, who said, freedom of speech and freedom of religion doesn't stop when you leave the state and neither should the Second Amendment. That's his quote. Now, he, I mean, and, you know, that sounds simple, right? Like the freedom of speech and freedom of religion doesn't stop when you leave the state. Neither should the Second Amendment. Now, that sounds like all nice and pretty. The problem is, is that it's totally BS. And here's why. Someone with a history of domestic abuse, drunk driving, you know, I mean, violent, beha- like, you know, violent criminal behavior, they can exercise freedoms of speech and they can exercise freedoms of religion. And there's a pretty good chance that nobody's going to get killed and nobody's going to get hurt. At the most, somebody is going to get offended by something they might say, but they can exercise those freedoms without being a threat to public health and public safety. Okay, they can say what they want, they can pray how they want, and, you know, somewhat, like I was saying, somebody might take offense, but nobody is going to die because a, you know, domestic abuser or somebody who is a, a former felon, somebody who's committed violent crimes in his recent past, nobody dies when they, when those guys practice their freedom of speech or their freedom of religion, you know? And this is why the, you know, like, you know, states are able to have like some uniformity of these rights, you know, across state lines. This is totally different when it comes to guns. And this is why there are no such thing as gun rights. All right. There is a long, bloody trail of evidence to prove that domestic abusers, when given a chance to own a gun, take their abuse to another level. That I mean, they have a weapon now, like they have a criminal background. They have a dangerous background and you are empowering them with a weapon. This is no long. You are no longer talking about rights. You are talking about a privilege. Gun ownership in America, I have no problem with legal gun ownership in America if it is looked at as a privilege, as if it is looked at as a responsibility. It is not a right. It is a privilege, which means that, yes, now the state has every reason to regulate who gets to have that privilege, and they get to decide who is demonstrating the responsibility to carry a loaded weapon in public. In, and that too carry a hidden loaded weapon in public. The states have every reason to determine who is responsible, who is not responsible when it comes to setting up these laws. It is wrong for the federal government to tell states with strict gun laws, you know what, tough luck for you, these states with weaker laws now get to decide for the rest of us what's safe and what's not safe. These states with the weaker laws get to put you know, people on the streets because they were able to go to these, to these weaker states, pick up a concealed carry gun permit, and now walk around with a, I mean, with a weapon that's hidden from the rest of us, and it be legal? I mean, like... Th- This is not the kind of thing that, you know, states with strict gun laws should be subject to, considering how much work that they have put into public safety and how much they've, you know, tried to look out for all of our health. And it's just simply, you know, one of those things that I just feel like this is where the entire argument about gun rights, gun rights falls apart. It simply is not a right. It is a privilege. It is responsibility. It needs to be subject to the kinds of regulations that we put on all of our other privileges and responsibilities, like, hello, driving. 
If you let somebody who, I mean, you know, we allow states to decide who gets to have a driver's license and not, well, have a driver's license. We have a data system that, you know, that crosses state, you know, state lines so that our police, so that our law enforcement groups, so that our policemen can actually figure out like, okay, like what is this person's driving record? And it's attached to that driver's license. We have nothing like that for concealed carry gun permits. And until we do, and until some of these weaker states start to catch up with the rest of us, I have a very, 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 very hard time supporting something like federal mandatory concealed carry gun re- permit reciprocity. I simply cannot get behind that. And, you know, the funny thing that I find about a lot of this when it comes to the um, the conservatives who, you know, want to you know push this from the federal government is that. These are guys who talk about states' rights all the time. I mean, like, they will have us believe that, you know, governors like George Wallace back in the 60s in Alabama had it right that, you know, that states should, I mean, be allowed to do whatever they want to whoever they want. Now, when those states actually do something correct and actually something better for public safety under the umbrella of states' rights, why can't these conservatives get behind that? Why can't they respect that, hey, a state that has strict gun laws does so for a reason? They're looking out for the the health and safety of their people. You know, so I've never understood this entire thing with like, you know, like how conservatives conveniently, you know, forget about federalism when it comes time to talk about guns. Now, I, you know, if you care about this issue as much as I do, I really hope that you get involved and uh, get in touch with your senators because, you know, the gun lobby extremists have actually been really successful in this cause. They've only they've got like a very short list of Democrat senators who they are optimistic are going to support this nonsense. And uh, and these Democrat senators need to hear from you. Uh, they're from states like Indiana, North Dakota, um, both senators from uh, New Mexico, um, John Tester from uh, Montana, Claire McCaskill from Missouri. Uh, we got Michael Bennett from Colorado, Bill Nelson from Florida, Angus King from Maine, and Senators Tim Kaine and Ann Mark Warner from um, Virginia. Um, all these guys apparently are sympathetic to this idea, but if they hear from you, if they if you raise your voice and let them know that you know states with you know weak gun laws shouldn't get to dictate to the rest of us what you know what uh, where our safety should be, uh, there's a chance that we can put a stop to this entire thing. Um, you know, when it comes to, I mean, Senator Bill Nelson, Senator Tim Kaine, Senator Mark Warner, you know, you guys are from Florida and Virginia, and I can't help but you know you know, point out to you guys that your states have not even expanded Medicaid. How about expanding people's health rights long before you start talking about expanding their gun rights? I mean, for real, you know, maybe it's time that we actually look at like what rights we need in 21st century America to survive, to thrive, to be safe, to be healthy. I mean, like, I would think that expanding Medicaid is far more important than expanding gun rights. And it's high time that, you know, you guys got back in touch with your governors, with your state legislatures and make something like that happen. Allowing states with like weak gun laws to send people with, you know, with concealed carry permits back to these home states, you know, you're just begging for trouble and you don't even have a health system set up to help the people who are going to get hurt from this kind of thing. You know, how about we put aside this nonsense about gun rights and actually work on expanding the health rights of our fellow Americans? Senators, this is within your reach, and I really hope that you second-guess your support for concealed carry gun permit reciprocity. It's simply the wrong way to go. Okay, so I've been on that rant for a little while, and you know, I really want to thank once again the people at Everytown for Gun Safety I, um, for writing that report. We're going to put a link to that report in the comment section under the video right here. And uh, I'm going to, you know, more than likely be writing this up on uh, the Huffington Post and you'll see a link to it uh, on that article um, when this video and uh, that article go up. Um, It's time to, you know, tweet your senators, write to them on Facebook, email them, you know, put in the phone calls, let them know that, you know, this is a kind of, um, you know, dangerous gun policy that America just doesn't need right now, that we really need to be working on people's health rights, not their gun rights. Um, Okay, so... 
you know that's uh that you know that for the second segment of the program i actually wanted to talk about a different kind of threat this is actually a microscopic threat this is superbugs this these are the uh you know the germs that we know um are being caused by our overuse of antibiotics so they are uh you know there's multiple drug resistant and um, antibiotic resistant bacteria that we need to you know be aware of and uh, we've got a guest for you on that so stay tuned for that when we come back uh, you've been listening to dr america i'm your host dr sanjeev sriram when we come back we're going to be tackling that issue and you are not going to want to miss it we've got a really good guest and i'm excited to talk about that with you guys we'll be back in a few minutes You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back. This is the Dr. America Show. I am your host, Dr. Sanjeev Sriram, here on the We Act Radio Network. Thank you very much for joining us. So for this segment of the program, I want to talk to you guys about a concerning health story that came out um, over the last couple of weeks, and that's involving these uh, multiple drug-resistant bacteria, also called superbugs. And the most recent outbreak that we've heard about is at um, the UCLA Medical Center, the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. And uh, at least seven people, uh, two of whom have died, have been infected with an antibiotic strain of bacteria called carbamipine uh, resistant enterococcus. I know it sounds that's a mouthful right there. Uh, but basically, you know, they were these patients were undergoing uh, endoscopic procedures. So that's like where they have like a little cyber uh, cyber optic cable tube uh, that goes down um, the throat and into the stomach and into the intestines. And uh, it lets doctors and specialists uh, look at those parts of the body to make diagnoses, to do treatments. Um, it's a really common, uh, it's a pretty common procedure. Uh, about half a million people in the United States undergo these kinds of uh, procedures with these kinds of medical equipment. And you can imagine that it's really scary if you go to the hospital where you think you're going to be getting better if you're already sick or you're going to get some reassurance that the problem that you're having is not as bad as you thought it was. Um, to be infected from instruments that have been embedded with these infectious materials, uh, it's pretty scary. And so, you know, a lot of um, uh, this particular public health uh, issue is uh, within our ability to control. It's a, uh, with definitely within our ability to understand. But it is one of those things where we can't really just leave it up to the scientists and the infectious disease specialists. All of us are tied together in this web of mutuality to understand what each of us can do to prevent the rise of these multiple drug-resistant bacteria. And to help us get a better handle on um, the story, I'm really excited to introduce you guys to our uh, next guest, Dr. John Powers. Uh, he is a actual um, he is an infectious disease specialist. He is uh, an associate clinical professor uh, nearby here at the George Washington University School of Medicine and at the University of Maryland. Um, I'm really excited to bring him on, and I just want to, um, you know, make sure I introduce him the right way. And I've got, uh, you know, um, a little bit of time to talk to him before we bring him on the program. So just to let you guys know, um, you know, he. Uh, has had actually a lot of interesting work when it comes to this particular topic. Uh, Dr. Powers was the lead medical officer for antimicrobial drug development and resistance initiatives at the U.S. FDA. 
He was co-chair of the U.S. Federal Interagency Task Force on Antimicrobial Resistance. Uh, Prior to joining the FDA, uh, Dr. Powers was assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and he is still on faculty there. He also actively cares for patients weekly in clinic and attends um, a lot of um, the uh, patients who are on the infectious disease inpatient service. Uh, He's been an investigator for uh, over 50 clinical trials. He has particular expertise, expertise in the design, conduct, and analysis of clinical trials and has published on various aspects of clinical trial design. Um, He's won a bunch of awards. He's been nominated for the 2008 Distinguished Clinical Teacher Award by the NIH uh, Fellows Committee. And he was a recipient of the 2010 NIH Director's Award. Um, I'm really excited to have Dr. Powers on the program. Um, I think that you know he's uh, just the kind of expert that we need to, you know, wrap our minds around this, uh, you know, th- this issue in microbiology and public health. And um, and I think that it's the kind of thing where, you know, the numbers, like I was saying before, they don't sound all that impressive, right? I mean, at UCLA, we're talking about, you know, seven people, maybe eight people um, who've been infected with these, uh, you know, with these bacteria. But the thing is, is that like none of us should have to worry about this when we go to the hospital. And that's the reason why I feel this is a particularly important uh, news story. And it's why, you know, I, I want to uh, cover this topic. So, um <clears throat> uh, so I'm really excited to have Dr. Powers uh, with us. And uh, Doctor, are you there? Yeah, thanks, Sachi. Thanks for inviting me. Hi. Okay. So, um, you know, thanks for mu- so much for joining us. Um, you know, this was uh, one of those like very sciencey topics that I'm hoping um, that we can, you know, ra- wrap our minds around and bring it down to some brass tacks that our listeners uh, can, you know, feel like they can actively engage on, and that it isn't just for um, you know, brilliant scientists like yourself to work on that it is actually a public health issue for all of us as Americans. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is a problem that all of us need to tackle. And this issue with the endoscopes, I think, raises a lot of issues in terms of, um, you know, first of all, you want to make sure that the people actually needed that diagnostic test to begin with. Um, and secondly, you know, that we need appropriate infection control processes to sterilize these kinds of things, which is another thing we often take for granted is that, you know, for instance, if you go into surgery, you're assuming that the scalpel that's going to cut you open has been properly sterilized. And that's really the issue here, I think, was one, at least with these endoscopes, of one of proper infection control. So it, it gets beyond just the usage of antibiotics, but even all of us um, have, can have an impact on this by not asking for antibiotics when we don't need them. And that's been an issue that's been around since penicillin was first discovered in the 1940s. Right. So, you know, I mean, why don't why don't we look a little bit more into um, the kinds of germs that we're talking about? You know, because I think that, uh, you know, we hear about, you know, now it's a CRE over at UCLA, but there's also VRE and MRSA and, you know, a whole lot of this alphabet soup. So what kind of germs are we talking about? Like, what do they do? Well, actually, the, the, the main issue here is not really about the germs. It's huh. about the kinds of patients who actually get sick with these things. Um, in December's Nature Journal, there's a great article by Arturo Casadevall, which talks about, the, the title of it is, Ditch the Term Pathogen. And what he actually talks about is that disease is actually caused by the interaction of one of these germs with the person's own immune system. Um, In fact, most people don't realize that when you chew your food, brush your teeth, floss your teeth, that you can get bacteria in your bloodstream between 20 and 80 percent of the time. But that doesn't cause disease because your own immune system is capable of fighting those things off. What happens is when a person's immune system isn't functioning properly, for instance, in the types of persons that may undergo a bone marrow transplant that get cancer chemotherapy, where the treatments for one disease actually uh, affect the person's immune system, they then become more vulnerable to these kinds of infections. So it's, it's a combination of not just super bugs, but not so super patients, people whose immune system isn't functioning properly. And I think that's really important because the vast majority of these kinds of infections do not occur in healthy people that are walking around on the street. They occur in people who have been very sick in the hospital for long periods of time, have gotten prior antibiotics. And consistently, studies show that again and again, 
receipt of a prior antibiotic, being in the hospital, being sicker to start with, is what predisposes people to get these kinds of infections. Yeah. There are some that occur in healthy people, such as what's this one called MRSA, or methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. But that brings up another issue, and that is methicillin is a drug that was discovered in the 1950s and hasn't been used for decades. Yet we describe these bugs in terms of their interactions with drugs that don't even exist anymore, um, and what happens to them in the test tube. What's really important that makes the, these things dangerous is not what happens in the test tube, it's what happens to patients. And so the issue of resistance is that drugs that used to be effective would be less effective um, in these situations where people are infected with these kinds of things. There are loads of bacteria that are present in the dirt outside your house that are intrinsically resistant to antibiotics, but they don't cause problems for people because they don't cause infections or because your immune system is able to fight them off if you skin your knee while you're out there doing your gardening. Right. So it sounds like, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you're helping us kind of like redirect our focus, you know, um, you know, towards helping the most vulnerable um, of our fellow Americans, um, you know, when it comes to talking about this issue. Um, but I am curious, I mean, you know, you had uh, mentioned earlier on about um, the way that we use antibiotics, you know, even uh, among us healthy people, you know, like, I mean, I know that I have a lot of patients who, um, you know, come into the clinic hoping and expecting uh, to be prescribed an antibiotic uh, when I've heard that, you know, up to 50% of the time, our patients don't really need it. Um, so, you know, there is that role of excessive antibiotic use, but is it really limited to just like our clinical use or are we talking about antibiotics outside of clinic too? You know, antibiotics are used for all sorts of things. If you actually think about it, antibiotics are one of the only classes of drugs that is prescribed by all types of clinicians. Um, from podiatrists to veterinarians to dentists, all, all over the place. Think about cancer chemotherapy. It's primarily limited to certain specialists. Um, but the other place that antibiotics use quite widely is in animal and livestock um, procedures. So, for instance, there are some 8 billion chickens in the United States. In fact, you know, if the um, far side cartoons ever came true, the chickens would take over the country because they outnumber us logarithmically. Um, but what happens is that these animals, when they ingest antibiotics, can then develop antibiotic-resistant bacteria in their intestines, and they leave that behind in the chicken coop for the next chicken to ingest, which causes a vicious cycle of resistant bacteria. Studies have actually shown that you can actually culture those bacteria off the chicken meat that's actually found in retail stores. Um, so the use of antibiotics, which may be as much as 80% of antibiotics in the United States may be used in animals instead of in people, also contributes to this problem of antibiotic resistance. Wow. So as much as 80%. That is amazing to me. Amazing. So well, the problem is we can't get accurate numbers on that because the way the law is written does not actually allow FDA to be able to collate the information on antibiotic usage in animals so that we can actually even get accurate numbers, which is a problem in and of itself. You have to define the problem before you can do something about the problem. Right. So, I mean, that's interesting to me. So, I mean, so th so does that mean that the FDA and the uh, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, they're not, uh, they're not talking to each other? They do, but they actually serve different functions. And, and, in fact, I think there's a move now to try to harmonize some of what each of these agencies do in terms of their approach to foodstuffs. Um, but they do talk to each other. In fact, the USDA is a participant in gathering that kind of information on you know, what's found on retail meats. Um, but the issue here is that FDA approves the drugs, but then has a limited capacity to be able to get back information on how the drugs are actually being used. Okay. So that, that issue is really an FDA issue, not a USDA one. Got it. Okay. So, you know, while we're talking about these government agencies, um, I, you know, I was intrigued that to learn that you are the, uh, or you were the co-chair of the CDC's interagency task force on uh, an antimicrobial resistance. And uh, that task force actually has a public health action plan uh, with a couple of areas of focus. Um, do you mind walking us through that a little bit? task force public health action plan is a collaboration of I think it's 11 different agencies throughout the US government and it has three different focus areas um, the first of which is what you've already been talking about surveillance prevention and control of antibiotic resistant infections and in fact the endoscope issue you were just talking about certainly falls into that category the second is research on developing better therapies to treat 
infectious diseases. And, and much of this has focused on developing the next antibiotic. But, in fact, when you talk about antibiotic resistance, there's two words in it. The one is the resistance speech, which we already talked about means the worst patient outcome. But the second part is antibiotic. And the part of this is that we have focused on the development of antibiotics for literally the last 80 years. And the question is, should we be doing research on novel treatments, for instance, using these little viruses called bacteriophages, which may actually attack the bacteria, and then once they've killed off those bacteria, they sort of commit suicide. Ah, so we're t- you're talking about uh, using germs against germs. You got it, exactly. And when you think about it, the, who actually developed antibiotics was the germs themselves. Most antibiotics were discovered by being produced by fungus or bacteria themselves. So it's no wonder that they've been able to overcome them. After all, they invented them. Oh, so, so you're they, talking about the, that story that some of us have heard in uh, our first science classes about the fungus that actually developed penicillin uh, and the, the scientists found it accidentally? That's right. And in, in fact, cephalosporins were first discovered in sewer water off the coast of Italy. So you find these antibiotics in some odd places where the, the organisms themselves are making them. But working on things like um, drugs that may affect the human immune system to improve your capacity to fight off infections, um, drugs that may impact what's called biofilms. Some of these, these organisms produce what's like a Star Trek shield that shields them from antibiotics being able to actually get to them to be able to kill them. If you can dissolve that biofilm or the Star Trek shield, the antibiotics may be able to work better, and thereby we may be able to improve outcomes for patients, but also preserve or prolong the usefulness of current antibiotics. So this research has to go beyond developing the next penicillin-type drug to getting into really novel things that may actually help. In fact, the very first treatments for infectious diseases in the early 1900s were vaccines and also an immune therapy called serum therapy, where the antibodies from horses were taken and injected into people with pneumonia, and it clearly saved lives, although it caused a lot of side effects. And so from 1910 to 1930, that was the primary treatment for pneumonia before sulfa drugs and penicillins were first discovered. Interesting. So we're talking about, um, you know, so you mentioned like the first two areas, the surveillance, prevention, and control of antimicrobial resistant infections, and uh, the second area about how we actually research uh, antibiotics and actually, you know, look at like some pretty novel ways of thinking about um, our lives with uh, with germs. Um, what's this third area that the, uh, that the CDC's task force um, is focused on? So the third area is actually product development, and that is turning some of these research ideas, translating them into actual products that can be then administered to patients um, to, 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 have, to improve outcomes for them when people are seriously ill with these kinds of infections. So there's been a lot of discussions about how to do that. Um, there have been several bills put forth in front of Congress that attempt to streamline um, the way in which new treatments for infectious diseases are developed. And and some of those, unfortunately, seem rather ill-conceived. They, for instance, allow a new antibody to get approved on less evidence, which also may decrease our ability to tell whether the antibody even works to help people or not. Um, There was a bill that was introduced just about a week and a half ago called HEAL, Helping Helping Effective Antibiotics Last, which actually would focus incentives on drugs that actually have added benefits for patients. And that makes complete sense that if we are going to streamline the regulatory pathways for these drugs to get through, we should be picking and choosing amongst the drugs and and focus on the ones that actually have the most benefits for patients and allow them to get through the system faster. Some of the bills that they've been proposed would allow essentially any antibody to get through faster. And one, we won't know whether those things are actually beneficial for patients. And secondly, any kind of incentive program that gives every kind of drug an incentive isn't much of a program because it's not going to focus on what's really going to help people the most. Right, right. Okay, so, I mean, those sound like some really important areas um, that the task force is covering, and I'm feeling a little bit more optimistic. Um, you know, one of the other things that I learned about, um, you know, when uh, when we were um, looking you up as a guest was that you are the lead medical officer of antibiotic resistant issues at the National Physicians Alliance, and now you're on the NPA's FDA task force. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us more about your team's efforts. Sure. I I think I've sort of explained some of those. We actually 
um, have been working to try to support some of these bills like HEAL, which will actually, uh, um, not only does HEAL have in it this issue of how to streamline the process for getting antibiotics to patients, it also has in it um, in- increased monitoring of antibiotic usage, what the drugs are being used for once they're actually being put out in- into the marketplace. Um, and so we've been working on issues like that and trying to actually help develop the evidence base from which physicians and patients can actually make better decisions. Um, as you know, the U.S. spends the most for health care of any country in the world. In fact, if you would combine the next 10 countries on the list, we spend more than the next 10 countries combined, and yet we're something like 35th on overall health care. Now, that by definition means we're spending a lot of money on stuff that isn't really helping people. And so what our task force is actually trying to do is to help not only streamline getting medical interventions to patients faster, but to make sure that those interventions are actually better. So we want to actually, our our NPA, FDA task force is really trying to help FDA to focus on methodologies that may actually be able to get better therapies to patients, um, but still provide the evidence for physicians and patients that they need to know uh, about these interventions. Um, For instance, if you take the endoscopy issue that you just talked about, turns out that FDA knew about this as far back as 2009. Oh, wow. And, and, you know, knowing about it and saying, well, we put out a warning. I don't know, Stan, if you're a physician, do you know about this warning? I certainly didn't. Um, And so there needs to be better communication in terms of what the evidence actually is. Um, And again, you know, for instance, this this got a lot of, of... discussion because it was infections with antibiotic resistant organisms. Well, you know what? I'd be concerned if my patients were getting infected from an endoscope with antibiotic susceptible organisms. Right, too. right. Because if we talk about the numbers, um, you know, the CDC estimates about 22,000 people a year die from resistant infections. The Institute of Medicine estimates about 98,000 people a year die from medical errors. Oh, so wow. Yeah. These kinds of things, you know. Uh, using an endoscope which hasn't been sterilized could be conceived as a medical error. Giving antibiotics to somebody who doesn't need them could be perceived as a medical error. So, so many of these things are preventable um, if we take the right approach to these. Yeah. And that's what our task force is trying to do. So, um, you know, in these last couple of minutes, I was just wondering if you could, um, you know, help us understand what we can do as individuals in our immediate day to day lives um, when it comes to this issue. You know, like, um, I mean, a lot of us, like, you know, we're still kind of in winter time. I have a lot of patients, you have a lot of patients who, um, you know, really uh, have looked at antibiotics almost like a dogma. Um, you know, what can they do? You know, what can all of us do in our immediate day-to-day lives to, you know, get a handle on all of this? Yeah, I think the real issue that you can do on your day-to-day life is actually some pretty simple stuff. For instance, washing your hands may prevent you from getting infected in the first place. Um, children getting vaccinated when it's appropriate. So, for instance, the measles vaccine is highly effective, and measles is a disease that's so contagious that if you're in a room with somebody with measles and you haven't are not immune there's a 90 percent chance that you will get sick Um, so in those situations vaccination is appropriate i I don't want to sound like everybody should be vaccinated for everything because there are situations where you can make a choice about being vaccinated um, or not Um, so for instance if somebody chooses not to be sexually active the vaccine against human papillomavirus isn't going to do them much good So there are some situations where vaccines aren't going to be that useful, but certainly in childhood diseases, we've seen a remarkable decrease in the incidence of these potentially lethal illnesses when people do need, when the vaccines are very highly effective. The second thing is not asking for antibiotics in situations where you really don't need them. So when you get a cold over the wintertime, antibiotics are not effective in treating the common cold because those are caused by viruses, not bacteria. But even for some bacterial illnesses, antibiotics are not very effective. For instance, three studies over the last seven or eight years have shown that if you have an abscess that's caused even by MRSA, that once a physician lances that abscess and opens it up, the addition of antibiotics to that really offer no additional benefit whatsoever. Huh, Otherwise, interesting. Um, NIH did a study that was published in 2012 where they looked at people with acute sinus infections. 
and gave antibiotics versus no antibiotics and shows that the antibiotics didn't add anything in terms of people getting over the sniffles, et cetera, that they have from the sinus infection, yet it did cause more rashes and diarrhea. So what you're actually doing is you're hurting yourself by taking these drugs. You're causing more side effects you don't want, and they're not beneficial for people. So what people ought to be asking for is they show up at the doctor because they have some uncomfortable symptoms. Wouldn't it be much better to take symptomatic treatment that's actually going to help you feel better and the rest of this stuff is going to go away on its own. Um, and the other thing I think people need to do is to get educated about some of these particular infections. For instance, we published a study about a year ago where we looked at people, how fast it took them to get over pneumonia. It turns out that the cough, et cetera, gets better in about a week, but the fatigue lasts for almost as much as a month. Once people realize that, um, they're less likely to go back to the doctor and say, hey, doc, I still feel tired. Am I not over this disease yet? Do I need more antibiotics? So understanding the way that the disease actually affects you will also lead you to better understand that, look, this is just a part of this disease process. You're going to get better in a couple of weeks, and you don't need additional antibiotics for that. Right. Okay. So it sounds like we've got some really good advice for our listeners. It sounds like, you know, get educated, get vaccinated, and wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Uh, Dr. Powers, thank you so much for joining us uh, you know, today on the program. I feel uh, much better about, you know, my understanding of this issue. I hope our listeners do, too, um, because, you know, I think uh, we live in a media that loves to, uh, you know, I mean, fear monger, and uh, perhaps that's not exactly the uh, the right prescription for, uh, you know, for this uh, for this public health issue. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Powers. You're very welcome. Thanks. All right. And just to let you guys know, our listeners, we're going to have uh, all of those resources posted up online. It'll be in the comments section of this YouTube clip and on our Facebook page. We're going to put it up on Twitter for you guys so you can learn more. And just like Dr. Powers said, get educated, get vaccinated, and wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. All right. Thank you very much for joining us on this segment of the program. I'm really excited uh, to, that we got to cover this. Um, you know, when we, uh, you know, when we come back to you guys next week, okay? Next week, we've got a really exciting special for you guys. I'm going to be at the Supreme Court with the WEAC Radio Network. That's right. Dr. America, Dr. Sanjeev Sriram is going to be your health policy correspondent at the Supreme Court. Uh, why? Because the Supreme Court is hearing yet one more case against Obamacare. Yes, that's one more, like you know, court uh, trial about the uh, the legal standing of the Affordable Care Act, and that is called King versus Burwell. Uh, there's going to be a pretty good rally um, to you know with people who have uh, a lot of knowledge and a lot of uh, a lot at stake when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. We're excited to be a part of um, you know the Families USA Radio Row, and so. Definitely come on out to the Supreme Court. Come meet me. Come meet the awesome team at We Act Radio. And, you know, learn more about this important issue of King versus Burwell. Uh, when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, um, as you can imagine and as you know, I'm a huge supporter of Obamacare. I feel that it's uh, one of, probably one of the most important civil rights accomplishments uh, that we've seen in the last 20 years. And uh, I'm really, uh, you know, I'm hoping that the Supreme Court hears out um, this case and decides to uphold the law and help people get the subsidies they need to make ins health insurance um, affordable and accessible, because uh, that's basically what's at stake when it comes to uh, this particular Supreme Court case, is whether people um, in you know, states around the country are going to be able to get those federal subsidies so that they can afford health insurance. It's a, it's a pretty big deal, and I'm excited to be, um, you know, adding my voice and getting to meet some more people who have uh, done tremendous work for making the Affordable Care Act a reality for our fellow Americans. And uh, I hope you guys will join us there um, at SCOTUS to uh, to learn more, to um, raise your voices, be heard, and uh, you know, and I think it's going to be actually really important. Especially especially because when you look at how successful Obamacare was this particular enrollment season, there were 11.4 million people who have health insurance now who, because of the Affordable Care Act, either they did not have health insurance before, or if they had health insurance before, it wasn't a high quality plan with, you know, comprehensive benefits. And uh, these are people who are now being able to, you know, exercise their health rights and, uh, and go to the doctor when they need one. I think that 
you know, uh, what's being argued before the Supreme Court is actually fairly ridiculous. I think it is uh, pretty classist of uh, some people who are trying to nitpick at the law um, for what I don't even feel are flaws or, um, you know, a problem. I think that they've manufactured this crisis and uh, what's at stake is uh, the the health rights of our fellow Americans. So um, please come out and join us at the Supreme Court. We are going to be at the Methodist Church building right next door at Families USA Radio Row. Um, I'm excited to do it, and I'm looking forward to you know being your correspondent and uh, taking the show on the road. Even though uh, the road is not that far, it's going to be right across the right across the river here. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for listening to us, guys. Uh, to recap, you know this this episode we covered the uh, concealed carry gun permit reciprocity act that's being discussed in Congress right now. Please let let your members of Congress know on both uh, the Senate and the House that this is a ridiculous piece of legislation legislation, that there are no such things as gun rights, that there really are just gun privileges and gun responsibilities, and that states with strong and strict gun laws uh, need the support of the federal government, and that we shouldn't be undermining public health and safety uh, by allowing uh, dangerous individuals to go to weak states uh, or states with weaker gun laws, uh, get a, a, a gun permit to carry a concealed hidden weapon uh, in public. Um, you know, please let your uh, members of Congress know that this is something that, you know, is a major threat to public health. It's something that's totally preventable. Um, we're going to have uh, links to that Everytown USA uh, report that I was talking about before. And uh, when it comes to uh, this issue with uh, the superbugs, I really th- want to thank Dr. John Powers for uh, joining us today. I felt like I learned a lot. I, f- I think that uh, it's really important to kind of flip the script about how we think about uh, these germs and the kinds of patients that need our help and how we can uh, you know, do a better job of protecting ourselves and our fellow Americans. Uh, you know, get educated, get vaccinated, and wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Uh, thank you so so much for joining us this week. Uh, you know, I hope that uh, you know. I, I hope to see you guys next week at the Supreme Court. Let's do better. Let's be better. And until next week, salute to your health. WC 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. Hello, my name is Jim Gray, and I am a judge of the Superior Court in California and a former federal prosecutor in Los Angeles. I would like to talk to you for a moment about marijuana. Did you know that since the federal government first banned marijuana in 1937, usage in this country has actually gone up by about 4,000 percent? Or did you know that in the Netherlands, where adults are allowed to possess small amounts of marijuana and buy it from government-regulated businesses, fewer adults and fewer teenagers smoke marijuana than here in our country? Or that an American is arrested on marijuana charges every 38 seconds? If you are wondering if any of this makes sense, you are not alone. To find out more, contact the Marijuana Policy Project at 1-877-JOIN-MPP or visit them on the web at mpp.org. Thank you and good luck to us all. piece of music was played with only two instruments, a right hand and a left hand. Hands can do incredible things, but nothing compares to using them to help save a life with hands-only CPR. If an adult suddenly collapses, call 911, then push hard and fast in the center of their chest until help arrives. Hands-only CPR is recommended by the American Heart Association, 
and it's incredibly easy and effective. For more information on Hands Only CPR and to make your own hand symphony track, visit handsonlycpr.org today. The power to help save a life is in your hands. A message from the American Heart Association and the Ad Council. You're listening to We Act Radio, WPWC, 1480 AM. Visit us online at weactradio.com. 